Afternoon, everyone. How are we all doing? Um, gosh, the August already. Um, this year is flying by. I hope you've all had a good holiday if you've been away yet or you're still looking forward to one. Um, but to get straight in, I'm delighted this uh, this crowdcast, we're all going to look into the psychology of sales. And Dr. Chris Coner, thank you so much for uh, joining us all the way from Chicago. Wendy, thank you so much for having me. Very much look forward to being of service to you and your audience today. Oh, and it's very early, so we're very privileged. I think it was about 6.30 over there or something like that just now. 7 a.m., so we're looking forward to yes. a bright and beautiful day. Uh, lovely. Well, we're, we're, we're in Scotland here, and I know we've got some people over in South Africa as well, but in Scotland, we're, we're just about lunchtime, so we're just having our sandwiches and listening to you, um, hopefully, um, to give us a little bit of background in terms of um, you know, sales and the psychology of sales, because you have, you've launched a second edition book, um, which is Never Hire a Bad Salesperson. So, you know, we've got some good experience that we can unpick on that. And also, I know that you run a company that is really helpful, um, Sales Drive, in terms terms of um, looking at assessing sales talent and really getting into the nuts and bolts of what is the psychology around what makes a top biller. So I, I was explaining to you, the recruitment industry is really full of great salespeople as well as um, great recruitment assessors of people. Um, but one of the things that you know we're starting to look at is how do we get ready for quarter four and look at a little bit more from a, a sales and business development perspective. So a lot of our audience there will be really wanting to sort of unpick this. And I don't think it's a secret, if I can share with our audience that, um, or, or represent the audience here, is that we might be great recruiters, but sometimes we're not the best at recruiting salespeople for our own businesses. So I think really we want to understand, right, what, how do we get this wrong? What makes a good salesperson to unpick this? So, so from my point of view, I thought it was really interesting. And if we start out there, it's like, what? What led you to sort of look at the psychology of sales in the first place, Chris? Good question. All starts with uh, my, my background. Uh, initially, I was at a firm called Whitmer & Associates back 20 years ago. After I got my PhD, Whitmer & Associates was a firm in the suburbs of Chicago that focused on executive assessment. I'm sure some of your audience members know sometimes companies will bring in a psychologist to do an examination of someone who may be a potential VP or a potential uh, president of a company. Very rigorous process. It can involve an interview, can involve uh, sometimes assessments, can involve intelligence assessments, uh, job simulation. Very rigorous. They wanted to design something as rigorous as that for salespeople because, of course, sales is the lifeblood of any company. And again, sometimes sales managers will have the frustration or, or recruiters will have the frustration that they'll sit down with the salesperson and that salesperson says all the right things in the interview. Sometimes they even use sales techniques on the interview or in particular when a position is time sensitive to fill, it can feel in the moment like finally, you know, the cavalry is here. But then sometimes six months or a year down the road, that ends up unfortunately being the best sale that they ever really see out of them. And they'll have to asking, wait a minute, what happened to the person whom I interviewed? That's why I got started 20 years ago, again, researching everything that had been published on that topic academically over the last, what, 85, almost 90 years now, as well as looking at our own work, doing behavioral interviews with sales candidates, and then circling back with their managers thereafter to find out who really does become successful. That was the reason I got into that research, and it's been it's been fascinating uh, in terms of not only the things that are teachable, but those that are not teachable. Mm. So let's start unpicking that then. So you looked at your research in terms of you know what made somebody su successful. So either their traits, behavior, or just what you know have the what background have they come from? You know what yeah. what like, you know what did you find out from there? What were the sort of things that you decided that you should be focusing on that did equal great salesperson? Of course. So again, we found that many of the characteristics that most people, if you were to ask them, would classically expect to be important in a successful salesperson were still very important. Characteristics, of course, like persuasiveness and relationship skills and even organizational skills as well. But above and beyond any of those by far were these three non-teachable characteristics that continue to stand out and differentiate the highest performers, particularly those that are responsible for new account acquisition, or as we call it here in the United States, hunters. Yeah. Uh, the first one is what we, we call, call them hunters over here as well. So you're good with that. <laughs> good. Thank you. Good. So the first one, again, is what we call the need for achievement. And again, the need for achievement, when we talk about that in the salesperson, it's the person who wants to do well, simply for the sake of doing well. So that person who's high in need for achievement is just constantly focused on setting that bar high, set, you know, exceeding that, jumping over that, setting it higher again the next time, and really pursuing excellence 
simply for the sake of excellence. Sort of that um, the kid in school that just has to get high marks. And mm -hmm. it's interesting because as companies now are having to hire in some cases um, a little bit more remotely, we're yeah. finding, as you can imagine, that characteristic need for achievement just continues to become more and more important because you can't always stand over someone's shoulder. Mm -hmm. So that's the first piece, need for achievement. The second piece is competitiveness. And the competitive salesperson we find really wants to do two things. Number one, of course, they're always comparing their performance to the rest of the team because they just want to strive to be the best on that team, if you will. But number two, they want to win that client or that customer over to their point of view. Because to them, uh, psychologically, that sale is kind of like a contest of wills. And then the third piece is optimism. And that is the salesperson's sense of certainty that they will succeed, as well as, of course, their resilience to hang in there when they face the inevitable rejection that a salesperson just has to deal with. So we find it's those three characteristics all together, Wendy, need for achievement, competitiveness, and optimism that psychologically create sort of the perfect storm, if you will. And collectively, we refer to those three characteristics as drive. So interesting, because we've all thought, you know, and I know that a lot of people, fellow colleagues within the recruitment sector, I can relate to a lot of that. And definitely from that competitiveness side of it as well, because we've all looked at sports in order, if somebody has been sporty and competitive from that point of view, it's a good indicator that they want to win. What other sort of areas have you looked at from breaking that down in the competitive side of it? Oh, very good question. So on the competitive side, it's very common that people will look at you know, someone who's, who's an athlete, but oftentimes people who aren't athletes can still be competitive. Just look at the person's academic background in some cases. Uh, many of our clients will be uh, look, looking at students straight out of school, and they'll look at think, situations in which they were competitive in their day-to-day -day life, could be in, a, in an internship, could just be in classes. And a related question we'll often get is, well, what about, you know, kind of the bull in the china shop? Is the person going to be too competitive? That's why, of course, we combine that competitiveness with that need for achievement. The person who wants to do well for its own sake. Because, yes, the person can be competitive. That's wonderful. But when you also look at someone who is high in need for achievement, that's the person that, again, can dial it back if they need to. They're focused on excellence for its own sake. So if they're ever doing anything that's getting in their own way, you can give them direction on that. And they're like, again, that student in school that just wants to get high marks and will improve if you will adjust for you. Interesting. So, you know, looking at sort of, you mentioned as well, one of the things in terms of interviewing and there's lots of mistakes that are made, or sometimes we hear what we want to, we want to hear and think, great, you know, we've, we've got a good, good person here. Can you talk me through some of the mistakes that people will, will generally fall into that when they're trying to assess? So I think to be fair, most of my audience would go into an interview for a salesperson looking for, they may not have positioned it in the right way, you know, in the same you know, articulate way that you've done there and saying one, two, three, that's what I'm looking for. But in their head, they're probably going in looking for those types of traits. So where are we getting it wrong? Of course. So um, a couple of things, uh, just in terms of the candidate sourcing, sometimes when companies are bringing on their own salespeople, they, they, they're they looking for certain traits in the person's background. And one of the things that sometimes um, our clients will get a little bit stuck on is they'll come to us and say, you know, we had this candidate come to us. They were very successful at this very large company. Uh, we're, we ourselves are a little bit smaller, but we thought, wow, this person has been so successful in the past. Surely they must have had, because they're at this company, world-class sales training. They had a great track record. So logically, surely they must be prepared to bring that same degree of success, success to bear for us. But the key question, of course, is what really led to that person's success? Was it their own effort? Or was it really the fact that in that situation, they had all that collateral material and brand recognition that were really kind of opening the doors for them? So we'll typically recommend finding someone, if the company is smaller, who has been successful at a smaller company where they have dealt with those challenges that are inherent when they don't necessarily have all those advantages. So that's one of the first mistakes people make, the big company mistake, if you will. Number two, during the interview, uh, they make the mistake of what we'll call in our book, the what if trap. What would you do if a client did this? What would you do if a prospect said that? Asking the candidate, what would they do if something or other happened? Well, of course, a question like that can be, be great for determining diagnostically, does the person know the right things to do? And in terms of training, what can we do to help that person improve? But they don't tell us anything about whether they will actually engage in that behavior. Rather, of course, in the interview, naturally, uh, as I'm sure you know, we want to go into those behavioral interview questions. So how would you rest. switch that? Because I think a lot of people would think, well, gosh, I might have done that in the past. Um, so how would you or how would you advise that you switch that in order to try and get that engagement? 
Of course, uh, we want to find out about things that they've done in the past. And so we'd ask them to tell us about a time, tell us some stories. Tell me about a time when your organizational skills were particularly important to you. Or tell me about a, a particularly challenging client relationship. What was the most challenging aspect of it to, to develop, if you will? So asking the person to tell you about specific situations that they've engaged in in the past that reflect the characteristics that we would like for them to show for us going forward. So when you have your characteristics ready that you're looking for, then sitting down and coming up with your list of questions that you're going to go after for each of those characteristics that, again, look at the person's past. That, again, makes it much more likely that you know, you're going to be able to get an accurate reading on whether they're going to bring those uh, traits, if you will, to bear for you going forward. Excellent. And of course, another classic mistake is hiring someone just like you. That's another, that's another big one. You know, people oftentimes in the interview, they bond well with someone. And yeah. the challenge, again, when you see someone who's just like you in the interview, it can feel like, okay, you know, this person's a lot like me. Surely they're going to get along great here. But then the challenge, of course, is that if the person is a lot like you as an interviewer, chances are they may share some of your strengths as well as potentially some of your developmental opportunities. So if you find yourself bonding. I love like, how you just said that your developmental opportunities rather than maybe your weaknesses. <laughs> of course. Of course. Again, it's a great strategy for making friends, but a terrible strategy for hiring salespeople. <laughs> so, so halfway through the interview, one way to remove that blind spot, halfway through the interview, if you do find yourself really bonding uh, with that candidate, just sit down and say, okay, maybe the person's taking a little bit of a break. You can sit down and think about, okay, I'm really connecting with this person. Mm -hmm. What about myself? If I were to take on this role now, might particularly get in my way. It could be something, for, for example, about organization or something of that nature. And then once you identify that for yourself, that might be challenging to you. When the person comes back, dig into those areas now. Yeah, like how do you deal with this, you know, and, 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 um, and see where they go with that as well. And, and, and exactly. check out, because you should know your own sort of development opportunities to challenge them. I think that's a really good tip because it is very easy for you to feel comfortable with somebody that you are interviewing. And, and let's face it, you know, a good salesperson is worth their weight in gold, isn't it? So generally, sometimes when you are interviewing a good salesperson or what you perceive as a good salesperson, you're almost at the stage where you just want that interview to go well because it, it yes. feels like, I want to hire that person before you're even asking the questions. Yes. And I think very, that's very true. That everybody fits, you know, falls into as well. What about motivations? What about aspirations? You know, you said that, you know, somebody wants to compete, wants to be good at things, et cetera. How, you know, a recruitment, a recruitment industry has been largely in the past, perhaps changing with some of the, um, you know, the, the, the new generation coming into the industry, but mm -hmm. we've largely looked at if they're money motivated then they're going to be good. You know, what, what uh, do you yes. think about that? That's a really good question. You know, looking at that aspect of the, if the person is money motivated, we've had many clients come to us with frustration saying, you know, Dr. Croner, we can't understand it. We've had so many salespeople get up to a certain level of production. We know they can succeed if they want to, but for some reason, they've just leveled off. Quarter after quarter, they're just turning in the same results. We refer to these individuals in our book as the flatliners. And so I've asked them, what do you look for in a candidate? And they say, well, we want someone who's motivated by money. Or, for example, someone who has external pressures like, for example, a mortgage or a couple car payments or kids going to school, external things to motivate them. And the challenge we find if the salesperson is strictly money motivated is that they tend to get up to a certain level of production. And now at that point, they've satisfied those money motivations. They've essentially achieved the lifestyle that they were going after, or they've eliminated those external pressures inevitably. Now at that point, they essentially know what they need to quote unquote phone in quarter after quarter just to maintain. Whereas the person who's motivated by need for achievement, as we discussed, will continue to excel. They'll continue to produce. To be sure, money is still important to that person, but they look at money the same way that, say, a great athlete looks at points on the scoreboard, if you will. It's how they show how well they've done rather than their goal in and of itself. So really, when we look for that need for achievement, we want that person who wants to do well for its own sake. Money is still important to them, but it's not the be all and all. I think that's so important because you do get to a stage where, you know, in growing companies that it's almost like somebody levels off, isn't it? And, you know, ultimately that's the sort of person, that's the person that you're looking to hire as well, because those people have got the experience that you're really looking for. So it's almost, if you're going to buy that experience, how do you know that that experience, that experienced person is going to continue to grow with with the job that you're then offering on as well, and I think that's really key and important. And, and I can see a lot of a, a lot of examples in terms of you know people we've worked with that 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 could have happened. It's like they're almost never happy. They'll continue to push themselves. And exactly. That's what for, yeah. 
Exactly. And that's the challenge past the age of about 21, 22. There's not much we can really do to change the person's mm -hmm. overall level of drive. As we talked about those three characteristics is kind of either it's there or it's not. And so it's all about making sure that we're, we're doing a good job of assessing those characteristics in our, in our, our process. And, so did your, and, did your research, sorry, just to interrupt, did your research actually demonstrate that, that once you're past 21, there's not much you can do to change those, you know, inherent motivations. So you've, yes. you've either got it or you don't. In, in, in fact, uh, not not ju just in terms of our work, but just in terms of the research in the past, as I uh -huh. mentioned, everything that has been published academically on that topic really looks at those, particularly that achievement striving. That's one of what psychologists call the big five uh, fa factors of personality. It's a facet of what they call conscientiousness. And again, past the age of uh, 21, 22, there's not much we can do to change it, sort of that combination of nature and nurture, if you will, mm -hmm. by that particular point. So we find that, again, because those are relatively hardwired by that point, it should really just behooves us to do what we can to assess those in the process. Interesting. That's so interesting, because sometimes if you can't buy in that experience, you might almost be better at getting somebody that is younger, but still has that drive to go forward than maybe even if you did buy in that experience, but they didn't have the drive to progress. Exactly. So, yeah. So that that um that leads me to another question. You know, in our industry, we tend to um a lot um you know either make the mistake or it works out. But we tend to take at somebody that's very good at sales, and we tend to then expand their role in order to to manage people. Um. Now, I think you know that's an area that a lot of people will say, mm, you know. Either you get to a stage where if I didn't do that with this person because, you know, they were looking to do more and achieve in different areas, then I might have lost them, you know, right. but does it work? Is it different personality traits? What's your thought of that, Chris? That's a very good question, Wendy. You know, that's, that's so common, you know, that the company wants to do right, if you will, by that person. So what they want to do is they'll say, okay, you know, you're on this, you're, you've succeeded to this point. You've done so well. We want to give you the next stage in your career, become a sales manager. And of course, the challenge with that is, you know, if the person has been successful as a salesperson, particularly a hunter, as we discussed, yeah. heretofore, they have gotten results through their own efforts. Now, if we're asking them to be a sales manager or a sales leader, now they need to get results through others. And yes. that is a completely different uh, kettle of fish, if you will, that we're asking for that person to do. And the person who is successful as a salesperson may be miserable in that role. They may even have to take a pay cut in some cases moving into that role versus what they were doing. In, in Absolutely. The and that is that is um, very much the case, you know, so so I. Have you done any research in terms of the types of traits that would be good to get results through people against, you know, people that are getting results, exceptional results for themselves? Well, in terms of getting results through people, it's all about the characteristics uh, that, are, that successful managers have. So being a good leader, being able to understand what, what makes uh, their um, their, their, their team tick, being just curious about their, their, their team and what they can do to take their performance to the next level, really taking responsibility for, for doing that, for enjoying that aspect of leadership. It's really, the, you know, the person who's a successful leader maybe is, is wonderful at kind of getting results through other, other people. And that t tends to be what it is that, you know, it's that person that just enjoys um, kind of making sure that they are, they are getting results effectively. They're, they're leading their team effectively. They're setting a plan effectively. They enjoy planning behaviors for others, all of those aspects. Uh, they, they have good problem solving skills, good conceptual ability, analytical ability, um, all of the things that go into someone being a, a successful leader. That's really not as much our research, um, but we focus more on the sales side, the salesperson side, the person who wants to get results as a hunter, uh, if you will, that just enjoys uh, doing well for its own sake, finding out what makes that, in this case, the client or the prospect tick, and doing their, their best to, again, when they, they go into that meeting, when I'm really prepare for that and really have success uh, in kind of helping the person, not in a manipulative way, ever, but just in a way to help, help the person decide what they really need and how can they, as a salesperson, help that person achieve that, help them get at, get, get that get that need met in a way that's that's effective, the way that when the, you know, the client engages with that salesperson, they are better for having done so. I think that's one of the things that leads salespeople sometimes to have a bad image. And we talked about that a little bit early on. Yeah, we did. Is, is that sometimes uh, clients don't feel that they've been left better having had that interaction. And that's one of the key hallmarks of someone who is successful as a salesperson is they leave that person feeling better for having interacted with them because they've given them a solution that they did not have heretofore. They've helped them to take their own performance as, you know, in whatever role they, they're, they're into the next level. And they've done that in a guided way rather than in any way that feels manipulative at all. Yeah, I think that's a, a really good aspect that we sometimes overlook is that experience of mm -hmm. helping and guiding 
you know, because because actually a lot of people don't know how to buy. And I see the role of the salesperson is to help evaluate and guide that yes. person to make a good decision. Um, exactly. And, and sometimes that decision might not be the one that you want, but you'll be remembered and you will make sure that you are qualifying somebody that is good for your services, is a good fit for your company and, um, you know, will get a result. And I think that's ultimately what the result all the recruitment companies are going to be looking for as well. So. Yes. No, we did. We just, I'm just going to touch on that as well. We did look at the differences between how we perceive sales over in America and how we perceive sales over in the UK. And I think, you know, it's interesting because I often think that, you know, sales and marketing over in the, in the States is definitely looked at at a higher level of um, career and profession. And over in the UK right now, you tend to just fall into things over here and there's not really that steps. Um, you know, just out of interest over in the States, you know, do you do you have courses there? How do you sort of like actually go and perfect your sales? How do you learn it? Is it different to the, you know, over in the UK? Because I know you you deal with clients all around the world. Mm -hmm. What's yes, your observation of that? <laughs> Very good question. So, yes, here in the United States, well, there's still some of that phenomenon where people will they'll get into sales and they'll, someone will ask them, how do you get into sales? And they'll say, well, I just kind of fell into it. You know, I, I took a sales job and just discovered that I loved it. But nonetheless, there's a growing movement in many universities, for example, DePaul University, my alma mater, uh, that's that's creating curriculum around success in sales, giving students the, the opportunity to learn. You hear, here are the, the specific things you need to become better at to be a successful salesperson. So there are many different universities now that are developing curriculum. It's still kind of in its in its infancy, but it's growing. It's becoming more and more robust. So I would expect as there's more success on the academic side here in the United States, we're probably going to be exporting that uh, to other areas around the world. It's all about, again, understanding what sales should be and what it is not, and making sure that when we're giving someone the opportunity to become a salesperson, we're helping them to understand what is it that they really need to do, again, to make sure that the experience is positive, not only for themselves, but also for that client, leaving the person better in many ways than, than when they came to them, if you will. That's a good hallmark. But yeah, I think that the curriculum uh, on the, the United States side is continuing to grow, and I'd be willing to bet that that's going to expand to the rest of the world as well. It will continue to become more and more professional because if you think about it, as things become more and more automated now, yeah, there's often that distinction of, will sales become obsolete? No, it won't. People will always want to talk to someone. Yeah. Uh, but nonetheless, salespeople will be forced and organizations will be forced to professionalize more and more because of it. And I think that's one, one of the things that's going to contribute to more and more professionalization, if you will, on the on the college curriculum side. I actually love that. And I want to spend the next five minutes just on that topic, because I think, you know, looking at that sort of background of being able to assess that good sort of sales skills. But let's look at where recruitment sales is going as well and sales in general. You're absolutely right. We're all looking at how do we be more efficient, how do we automate everything else as well, you know? Mm -hmm. So where do you see, if we're looking at where recruitment, uh, sorry, where sales really goes, um, and I'm going to say recruitment sales, because essentially, um, you know, the hunter role within our industry, how mm -hmm. do you see that professionalism, you know, going, how do you see that role actually changing going forward? Well, it's all about learning new tools. You know, we talked about the characteristics that are not teachable, sort of the foundation of the house, if you will, need for achievement, competitiveness, optimism. But then above that, you have the characteristics that are teachable, things like relationship skills, persuasion, etc. When it comes to relationship skills, for example, the tools that we use to develop relationships are going to continue to change, continue to evolve. You know, and when you think of, again, the metaverse, as that continues to expand, there are going to be additional understandings that are going to be needed. But those are teachable things. Those are tools. And across disciplines, whether it's recruiting or consulting or any other discipline that requires careful interaction with people. I think the greater mastery of tools like video calls and things of that nature that say 10 years ago were very nascent and were, you know, you had the you know, the, the choppy images that you have to deal with. Now we're becoming more and more fluent in how to deal with those. There will be more and more and more of those. But again, that person who is high in need for achievement, for example, will continue to learn them. It's a joy to them. They will continue to expand their knowledge in those areas because they just want to improve. And as we continue to, um, to, to work together to build those types of technologies, as those technologies get more and more um, adaptable, as interviews become more and more meta, if you will, in terms of our, our ability to interact virtually with others, that, that's a skill. That's a skill that people are going to continue to develop. And the person who just wants to get uh, high marks, if you will, academically, is that same person who, as a salesperson, wants to learn those skills. So those are going to be the salespeople that are going to continue to excel, just as they have always excelled through the technology that has always existed in their own time. And I'm going to take it back to tools, exactly that in terms of actually assessing this, because I think that's a really good sort of synergy that you just said. You know, I always look for people that 
are inquisitive and want to learn. And I hadn't probably related back to actually that's because they want to learn to be the best. And it's that driving factor of making them the dress uh, the best that means that you've got to keep up with things and want to learn new stuff. So that's really it's a good thing for me to have clicked and joined the dots there with it as well. So, you know, you've gone down with all this knowledge. You've then sort of actually thought, right, OK, let's give everybody a way of being able to assess it with your your own um um, assessment tool, Skills Drive, um, yes. and I think somebody was um, sorry, Sales Guide, Sales Drive. Um, I think somebody was actually asking, what's the difference between like Thomas? There's so many of them out there. Um, Thomas International, I don't know if you heard of it, but that's one that oh, yes. yeah, UK use quite a lot, and and specifically they have sort of looked at the recruitment market for it as well. You know, what's the difference between all these tools? How do you stand out from an assessment tool in sales? Because there are a lot of them, I'm sure you're aware. So what's different about yours? Good question. There are many assessments out there, all great ones. Uh, in terms of sales drive, again, we focus, number one, we focus strictly on sales. So our, our assessment is developed for salespeople, but really two key differentiators thereafter. Number one, we're the only assessment that measures drive, need for achievement, competitiveness, and optimism, literally our patented model. At the same time, we do so in a way that's designed to eliminate faking using a question format called forced choice, particularly when we look for that drive characteristic. So with a forced choice question, of course, you're probably familiar. The person gets a series of three statements. Each of them or all of them sound positive. So a question might say something like, I consider myself a leader. Uh, I have great relationship skills. I'm very organized. Okay, now which of these is most like you? And which is the least like you. So that forces the person to make some challenging distinctions, but then gives us a much better sense of their real priorities and allows us to look at their consistency as they respond to those questions. Because as you can imagine, if they do attempt to fake an assessment like that, it's very difficult to do so consistently over time. And we've got that down to about a 20 minute assessment. So those are the big, big distinctions for us, looking at that drive characteristic that you need for a hunter and then doing so in a way that's designed to eliminate faking. And I think you're very right. I've done a lot of those things as well. And I, I tend to say, gosh, you've ended up confusing me. You can't remember what you've just said. So you end up just going, you know what, I'm just going to put what, what I feel is the correct thing. And and have you found that a lot of your, your customers are using them within the recruitment? Because one of the things that we used to do in, in terms of my old recruitment business was, you know, used to sell it as an added value in terms of that recruitment selection process. Have you found that that's something that um, your clients are doing as well and adding value to their clients. They are indeed. So yes, they're adding value to their clients using the assessment tool as well as hiring their own salespeople. Uh, again, particularly when they need a hunter, when you think about it psychologically, somebody who's going to go out and knock on a door, if you will, whether yeah. that's in person or over the phone, have that slammed in their face sometimes and then have to knock on the next one, if you will, with yeah. that much more certainty and passion and conviction, that's a very special person. So it's worth taking the time to make sure yeah. that you're doing that effectively. Definitely. No, thanks for that. So listen, we've got a couple last um, um a couple of sort of minutes and, and, and I normally at this point go and look at the questions and I've got an interesting question and, and I'm afraid, <laughs> sir, please help me, Joe. Um, I'm afraid, uh, I think it's Danny, for, um, <laughs> we probably aren't going to be able to help you today on that one, but we've got lots of recruiters on. So please, you know, feel free, get, reach out if you if you, you are looking for a job, that's fine. Of course. But any, anybody else that's got any questions, please post them in just now and we can then sort of share them or let me know any of your comments. Thanks for sort of putting on that. I think Neville, you've been um, sort of popping in saying, yeah, this is so right. You've got an office full of money, motivated salespeople, and they've all leveled off. I think that's the biggest thing I've taken from today's session is that you're absolutely correct. It's something that we've done in the recruitment world all along. And then we've wondered why, why are they not making that next step? Why have they kind of right. stopped? And, and and I want more from them. So I think that's been my biggest takeaway. But if you were to sort of help um, our audience today in terms of looking at the next, the sort of like two things, the top two things that maybe summarize your book, you know, which I'm sure will be a great read, never hire a bad sales person again. I'm definitely going to start. Is, is it available on audio? Is it just uh, unfortunately? Unfortunately, oh. no. It's it's just available via via hardcover and Kindle, so you can get it oh, instantly. I know. Um, we see us dyslexic people. We need it in audio. <laughs> you know, so I, I've gotten so many one. requests to record yeah. it, and I, I keep saying, you know, I should just record this in audio, and the people keep saying to me, "You'll never have the patience to do it." So <laughs> it's sort of that <laughs> sort of back and forth. No, I understand, but yes. Yeah, so I think you know, ultimately, the two top things of you know, looking at all your experience there of like never buying hiring a, a bad salesperson again or a bad salesperson again what were the two things that you think that our audience could take away and change the behaviors of their selection process that they've been making when they're looking at you know top billing um hopefully hunter salespeople 
of course, number one, if you're hiring for a sales hunter, make sure you're looking at those three elements of drive carefully. Need Say them again, Chris, just so we can take them down. Need for achievement. Yep. Competitiveness. And optimism. Love it. Make sure you're looking for those three. And number two, make sure you're combining some sort of a well-constructed assessment with a well-constructed behavioral interview. If you do those successfully, combining the two together, and you do that thoughtfully, you can absolutely stack your team with those high potential uh, salespeople. So again, thank you for the opportunity to be of service today. No, well, I really appreciate that, Chris, and thanks so much for um, you know sharing your your sort of the academic side of what we've all been sort of doing from a gut feel, and sometimes getting it right, some getting it wrong, and I think we definitely probably need to put a wee bit more structure on that. One thing I would add as well. Um, from a recruitment process, I think we jump into it saying that every sales job is the same. So we're just looking for a top filler, but really assess what the job is you want somebody to do. Um, because there are different types of salespeople, as you said, for large companies, for different types of sales, for quick sales like contract recruitment, for longer term sales like RPO or permanent sales. So the different structure will be that sort of different sort of elements of um of skill set as well, which I think is also quite an interesting dynamic there as well. It's not all the same. Very the characteristics sure. might be the same, but not the delivery as well, which I would add to as well. Well, listen, I know you've got a full day ahead of you in Chicago over there. You've just started. Um, we're just about to sort of finish up for lunch. But thank you so much again for sharing um, your thoughts. We've really enjoyed it. And I'm sure there's been lots of value there that everybody's got. Um, on next month's Crowdcast as well. So um, we're back in September now. And um, we've got, we had such a good response to um, getting James Bosher in for Head of Partner Success for CD Library. Because there's a lot of change happening in the the, the job board market and how to attract the best um, candidates and also pricing changes that have all been happening there and the, the, the understanding that job board market. So we're going to get him back in and uh, I hope you're all ready. You give him a good grilling the first time. Please come with all of your all your questions and uh, make sure we can get a good gr grilling again for James in September because I know he loves coming on the show um, as one of our partners as well. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll see that. It's on the Wednesday, the um, so not the 17th of August, um, it's the, it'll be the second second web Wednesday on um, in September again. So usual time at um, one one o'clock. So thank you for joining us. Um, if you are still to go in your holidays, please have fun, stay safe, and we'll see you in September. Chris, thank you again. Thank you so much. Really enjoyed it.